Remember First Man, the caveman from the National Insurance commercial? After our caveman buddy landed a gig at a national insurance company, he got the cash he always wanted. With so much moolah in hand, he decided to take flying lessons. But he would bang his head on the wall because the process to pass his FAA knowledge exam was so hard for him. Until he discovered Pro Aviation Trainers, the live online ground school. So he registered, and after just one weekend of training, our caveman friend aced his exam and flew off into a new life. If a caveman did it, you can too. Register today at www.proaviationtrainers.com. So, so like, first off, I, I know for a fact, I mean, I saw this test, I saw this question on the private test and the commercial test, um, and I think my instrument, because um, there's just weather on every written test you ever take. Right. Um, I even think it was on the CFI. I think they just like to throw um, the weather uh, question on there of, um, you know, how is what is the process of weather, and it's basically the result of uh, the, so. I mean, this is something to stand out: is uh, physical process of weather is accompanied by a result of heat exchange. That's basically weather, um, according to the FAA, and uh, what would be on the test. Um, um, Yeah, unequal heating of the Earth's surface that causes the variation um, in pressures and temperatures as well, um, and wind. Okay, and then just some definitions of atmospheric pressure. Isobars, those are the um, plotted lines of equal pressure between points um, on a weather depiction chart, um, which is, I believe, in the next section when we go over printed weather reports and, and uh, forecasts. You get to see a picture of that chart with the isobars. But, um, Okay, here's a little example I could show you. So here's isobars. I mean, this is like a humongous uh, map here. <laughs> but if you saw like a local area of like, you know, your local area in Texas or something, um, oh, it looks like there's a little typhoon going on out there. Um, you would, these isobars, the closer they are together, the stronger winds you're going to have because it's, it's pressure gradients, and as they get closer, you have stronger winds. So that's something to know as well. Um, but that's what they kind of look like. But that, sorry, that's like a world map. <laughs> right. Yeah, here you go. This is a little bit better. North America. Um, so you can see how so how wide these are. Like right now in Florida, um, pretty calm winds as a result. And closer to the isobars where there's pressure, um, you would have stronger winds. But here in some tighter areas, or definitely here around this low, you would have strong winds occurring here, and you can see weather forming. Right. You see um, that, around uh, that. Cold front pushing towards Texas, through Texas. Yeah. We've got, a, we've got a ton of weather right now here. Yep. Yeah. Anytime we have, especially in the winter, anytime Florida, we get like this is typical. A cold front will just kind of push down through, and anytime that happens, we just get some nasty weather uh, in front of that cold front. High behind us, bring nice, nice weather. Yep. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, we've already talked about standard pressure. That'll be pretty much memorized uh, <laughs> forever in your aviation career, 299R2. Standard temps 15C or 59 uh, uh, Fahrenheit. We've already talked about that when we went over the altimeter. Uh, about an inch of mercury per thousand feet. Right. Um, Coriolis force, there's usually a test question about this. Um, 
deflects the wind to the right in the northern hemisphere. It's caused by the Earth's rotation. Um, below 2,000 feet, has friction with the Earth's surface and it deflects the wind. Um, and the wind at the surface will generally be slower than the winds aloft because of the friction. Um, we definitely experience sea breezes, land breezes here in Florida. I'm on the coast. Um, and as far as convective circulation um, and action, I mean, it's, you know, uh, as the the wind for Florida, for instance, and if you were, you know, close to the coast um, around Texas, but that wind in the summer, we typically get an easterly wind, and uh, it, you can just see it on the radar. You'll just see uh, the cool moist air or the warm moist air hit the land and then the land uh, radiates heat from the sun and just pop up thunderstorms just light up <laughs> right at the coastline and then push inland and uh, that's pretty typical in the summer um, so front is a zone of transition between the two air masses different density um, the, uh, this is usually a question, I've seen this on almost every test as well, um, it might ask something along the lines of, on the FAA test, um, you know, what, what, how do you know a front passed or frontal passage occurred, um, and it's a change in wind direction, um, is usually when that uh, uh, front passes, you have a wind change, um, and also you can notice that in flight, if you're you know, up aloft as well, as well as on the ground or aloft. So thunderstorms, uh, good to know for the test, the, the three different phases. Um, one, I know a question that sticks out in my mind that I've seen a couple times on the different tests for weather is um, they ask, a common one is when does a thunderstorm reach a mature stage and it would be um, the start of rain and they'll give you dissipating and you think oh dissipating um, it's just rain but um, the mature stage is the, usually the start of it is, uh, is a rain beginning at the surface okay. can we go back one more just one yep. second the, uh, so you, the question is, how do you know when it's mature? Is that the? Yeah, they might. Say, they can always word it different. They might say, "What does rain at the surface signify? What stage is the thunderstorm?" And you would say mature. Um, or they might say, you know, uh, they could just word it back. You know, either way, they could say that. You know, rain at the beginning of the surface means which stage? Or they could say, "What is the sign of the mature stage of a thunderstorm?" And it, it would be rain beginning at the surface. So, and then here's your your kind of look at a thunderstorm, and this kind of looks like maybe a cold front pushing through and pushing that warm air up because you need a lifting action and unstable air to uh, for a thunderstorm to form. You just get all those updrafts. Um, or actually, this looks like a warm front pushing into cold air, pushing this way because the anvil is going this way. Why is it? Oh no! It's saying, I'm sorry. This moving to the storm's going this way. <laughs> um, the anvil. This is a big danger area. Um, never fly under the anvil. You can have hail stones, not little droplets, but huge stones uh, flying out of the anvil that could damage your airplane. Um, and the FAA typically says to stay clear of a thunderstorm uh, up to 20 miles you could experience you know effects from the downdrafts and turbulence and wind shear and things of that nature um, and never fly under the anvil and then also you can have hailstones um, you know within a couple miles of the storm you could uh, experience hailstones Yeah, so um, like I was saying, uh, you need unstable air, um, 
because uh, unstable air, like stable air, would be. Are you like? Are you familiar with the lapse rate, the standard lapse rate of temperature? Uh, no, no, sir. No, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, like the standard lapse rate, um, every thousand feet, um, uh, the temperature. If it, if it's a standard lapse rate. Okay. Okay, again, we're you know we're talking standard day, standard lapse rate. So the standard day would be 15 C at sea level, and then every thousand feet the temperature would drop two degrees C. So right, right. That, that that's a stable atmosphere; it resists um, lifting action of the air. So if it's unstable, if if the lapse rate is larger, like if the gap's three degrees or four degrees um, C, um, then that hot air can can just move up through that atmosphere. Um, so an unstable atmosphere or lapsed rate would promote a thunderstorm. If you don't have that, it's not going to um, form. Um, you obviously need moisture, so water vapor in the air, high humidity or, you know, um, and then something to start the process, that upward lifting action. So those are the three things you need to form a thunderstorm, and that um, definitely um, is a Modular question. That unstable I'm, lapse rate, is that uh, low pressure coming in or just a difference in pressure? Um, no, it's with the temperature, not necessarily the pressure, but typically uh, ba bad weather is associated with low pressures. Right, um, but I mean that would explain why you would have an unstable lapse rate, right? I mean, if, why, why is there a temperature delta? Is the question. I couldn't give you that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because of the pressure changes, but. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I'm sure it is. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the different pressures, the different temperatures, and the different temperatures in, in uh, air masses as well, I mean, is a result of the sun's heating, the moisture content, um, the different fronts pushing through and pushing different air masses up, um, things of that nature. But on a scientific level of, of understanding the association of the low pressure, the high, I couldn't answer that. Right. I'd, have to do some, I'd have to do some research. Okay. So um, wind shear, uh, obviously the biggest issue with uh, airplanes, uh, and like I said, up to 20 miles, um, it can affect uh, taking off or landing. Um, would not recommend trying to take off or land within 20 miles, but um, somehow the airliners do it. <laughs> but they have, they have the engine power. To, yeah, they're bigger, heavier, fly faster. They have the engine power to overcome the wind shear, and in our little Cessnas, we uh, we don't. <laughs> um, you'll probably see. Um, a figure on the FAA test um, that looks just like this. And you just need to know the different aircraft positions and what's going on with the airplane. So they might say, you know, what, what is aircraft uh, uh, one experiencing? And it would be an increase in performance and an increase in airspeed because you're getting a, uh, as you get a downdraft, you're getting a headwind. Right. So you're increasing your airplane's performance, probably a pitching up moment, a little bit of gain in altitude. Once you get to two, you're getting a down, a direct downdraft. So you're gonna, um, the airplane's gonna start losing performance and get, you know, losing altitude. Three, now you're getting a shift, a wind shift or shear uh, to the rear from the rear, a tailwind. You're gonna lose airspeed, lose performance, continue to lose altitude, um, and by four, hopefully. Uh, you've been able to recover. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. But yeah, I mean that image is pretty straightforward if you just follow the flow. Yeah. So these are the most severe thunderstorms. And squall line thunderstorms are, are some of the worst, where you get this situation. And they're ahead of they're what form ahead of a cold front. Um, thunderstorms have lightning. That's why there's some of those some avionic products that um, show lightning strikes. 
Um, that'll, you know, as opposed to radar products like the storm, there's, I think it's storm scope is one of them. Um, I believe, and they'll, they'll show lightning strikes. That's where your thunderstorm activity is. Um, or you could obviously see it on radar with, you know, your heavy precipitation echoes that return. Um, and these are very dangerous. Um, embedded thunderstorms, you know, if you have an overcast day at 6,000 feet and you're, you're flying and there's embedded thunderstorms above that layer growing, you can't see them. Um, but as a VFR pilot, look for the rain shafts. Um, that's what we do in Florida because we just have thunderstorms pop up all the time. And it, it was new to me. I mean, we had the pop-up thunderstorms in Pennsylvania um, in the summer. You know, it happened, but typically you'd see them on the radar. And in Florida, I mean, you check the radar half an hour before your flight, go take off, and then you just see a storm building in front of you in your flight path, and you have to fly around it. Um, but a way to avoid it is, you know, watch those rain shafts coming down. Um, icing, um, you need visible moisture to obtain icing, um, and you need the temperature uh, freezing or below. Now, that's not to say that, you know, you could look on your, your temperature gauge in your airplane, and it could be 34 degrees out, but because you're flying through the, the air, your structural surface is cooling below 32 degrees. So you can, you know, the structural surface, if it's below freezing, uh, you can experience icing. Um, Freezing rain is the worst uh, cause of, uh, or the greatest cause of uh, accumulation of structural ice. Um, ice pellets occur when the rain droplets freeze at a higher altitude, um, and that usually means freezing rain exists above. So um, it's just good to obviously know that type of thing. Um, more for, I mean, as a VFR pilot, you're you're going to probably be avoiding, you know, you need to know these weather conditions, but these really apply for sure as an IFR pilot if you're flying through clouds and flying through moisture. You know, if you get ice pellets, you do not want to climb. <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, mountain waves... Um, they're called lenticular clouds, uh, can form above them, that's a sign that there's a mountain wave, just air flowing over the mountain, um, and they kind of give like that almond or lens shape. Um, they can contain winds of 50 knots or more, and this, the clouds, they look stationary. I don't know if you've ever seen them. I haven't seen them in person. Uh, I haven't done much western mountain flying, um, but they look um, just in place. They don't move. and but there's, there could be 50 knots or more wind flowing through that area, flowing through those clouds that are forming in that, that spot location, uh, but they're stationary, they appear stationary. Um, can definitely expect mountain wave turbulence when the air is stable. So what's happening is, is when it's stable air, it resists lifting. So typically a thunderstorm would... Um, so if the air was unstable, this wind would hit this mountain or this ridge, and it would push the air up, and you'd have a thunderstorm form here. But if it's stable air, it'll just flow right over, and then you get these waves of wind and these layers and those lenticular clouds form right here. Um, and I was just saying the prime conditions for that are 40 knots or greater blowing across that ridge. If the wind's aloft or 40 knots or greater, and you have a stable uh, atmosphere, you could expect... Um, that type of turbulence over top. Um, and then obviously on the leeward side of a mountain, um, you could get, you can have a bad day over here. Yeah. <laughs> you get a yeah, lot of... Reading this morning on Fox News, they were interviewing some family that crashed their Cessna on the mountain in that same scenario. They, uh, While flying on yeah. the, the leeward side of the wind? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's... Again, I don't personally have experience with mountain flying, but just uh, learning about it, yeah, I would not put my aircraft over here <laughs> at all. I think you just would get high enough to go over it, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it depends where you're flying, too. I mean, if you, um, you know, some of the mountain ridges are 10,000 feet or so, or I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, 
Um, so wind shear can occur at any altitude, you know, rapid change in wind direction. Um, definitely a, a way to um, expect it and kind of predict it on your own is when you do a weather brief and um, you see a temperature inversion. So if the temperature at the surface, at, you know, your ATIS is reporting, uh, I don't know, you know, 20 degrees C and then, you know, uh, fourth, at the 3,000 foot winds a lot, well, you don't get temperature there, but uh, at 6,000 feet or, you know, if you get that temperature up there or if you're flying and coming in on approach and you hear your ATIS and you look at your outside temperature gauge on your airplane and it's warm and down on the ground, so you have that temperature inversion. Um, and if you have a 25 knot or more uh, wind aloft, you can expect um, wind shear as you're coming in on approach. And so you'd want to fly a faster than normal approach. You know, maybe add five, 10 knots onto your approach just in case you do have a loss of, of uh, airspeed. Um, and I've certainly had situations like that um, um, where I was coming in on approach and I had a 10 knot loss of airspeed, um, which is pretty wild. It's, it's usually a pretty bumpy day <laughs> when you're getting that. Um, yeah, so low level temperature inversions. And then this also, uh, I'm not sure if we're going to talk about this coming up, but um, these low level temperature inversions are most common at night on a clear night. Um, I know that was a, a test question on the commercial and CFI exam, but I'm not sure about the private pilot. But I mean, how, yeah, how would you know to expect it, I guess? It's well, if you had, you just want to be cautious because um, you, you know, you'd probably have, um, if you had a control tower, you know, the control tower could tell you, you know, what the winds have been doing. Um, but at night, you could just expect, if you had a really hot summer day, um, it was clear all day, and then you have a totally crystal clear night, and you're coming in for landing, you can probably expect that there's going to be a temperature inversion, because all that heat from the surface kind of radiates up, and then creates that temperature inversion. And you can get some some shear, some turbulence um, below that. So it it would just be expecting, you know, knowing how the day went and the night is, and and just being cautious as you're coming in. Okay. So we mentioned this a little bit uh, yesterday, the temperature dew point. Um, but so when you're within five degrees of the dew point. Um, and there's a decreasing trend. And um, I always like to um, I always like to look at the history of like the METAR reports whenever I'm doing a pre-flight. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really good to do, you know, look at the last three, four, five METARs and just see what the trend is, because that's the most up-to-date actual weather readings, you know, it's not forecasting, saying, oh, today it might be sunny or it might thunderstorm, you know. Um, and so if, if you see that the uh, um, the temperature dew point trend is getting closer, 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 now you're within five degrees, you know, at, at the time of departure, um, you can expect fog or low-level clouds at that point. Does the guitar um, give you pressure also? Yep. Yep. Okay. And that would be your altimeter setting. Um, so okay. it would give you your yeah. So it would give you your pressure, and that's another way to spot that you're flying into worse weather is your the pressure difference. Yeah. If if you're like three zero zero one from your departure airport, and that's two nine or nine or five at the arrival airport, you can factor in that you're going to probably be flying into worse weather conditions, lower ceilings, you know, right. stuff like that. Um, or, you know, watching the trend again, looking over the, the course of the day or the past four or five METARs, and if the, the pressure is dropping, you know that the weather is getting worse. So even if you're doing a local flight and you're only going up for an hour or so, you know the way the weather is trending, my ceilings might start to drop or something of that nature. So it's just a really easy way to watch the, because I think, you know, weather is really about just watching the trend, because the forecasts, I mean, the more and more you fly, you'll just learn that the forecasts are, you know, they give you a ballpark, but it, that's about it. <laughs> right. right. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is uh, dew point stuff.
and then I think, yeah, we talked about frost a little bit, and sublim, sublim, sublimation uh, is the term, you know, taking the water from a water vapor, a gaseous form, and then it just directly, it skips the liquid phase, it just goes right into a uh, ice crystal solid phase. Uh, yeah, so as it condenses, you know, obviously forms clouds, fog. I'm sure you know what evaporation is. <laughs> Sublimation, that's the new one I learned uh, getting in aviation. I think I learned it in science somewhere, maybe back in seventh grade, but forgot that process. <laughs> so fog, you know, it's it's good to know and uh, it could come up on your check ride. I mean, um, you know, they might ask you about certain types of fog or something like that. But um, obviously, it's good to know how certain fogs can can form and radiation. You know, um, clear sky. It's kind of that clear sky, uh, clear night, no wind, and um, the temperature dew point are close. And then, you know, the because there's a kind of a calm wind condition. Um, it just kind of like radiates, you know, just a muggy situation and the fog can form. Um, advection is typically coastal areas and moist air moving over a cooler surface. So the hot moist air, maybe you get that land breeze going out to the ocean. Um, and then, you, you know, here's a picture of what that looks like. Cooling that moist air down to the dew point and then you get a fog formation. Um, upslope, you know, pushing warm, moist air in a, in a stable atmosphere, because otherwise this air will just push up into it, build a thunderstorm. But in a stable atmosphere, you know, you can get some upslope fog, which would the, the um, uh, warm, moist air is pushing up to the tops of the mountains, and then it cools off down to the dew point, and you get some, some cloud or fog formation. Um, steam fog is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> uh, and then precipitation induced fog. Um, and this is typically, um, I don't think I have it, no, I don't have a good picture of it. But this is typically like you have, um, you have a warm front uh, taking over, you know, this is like maybe a cold mass of air. And then you have your your warm front and your, your warmer air overtaking that, and then you have rain falling down through and cooling, and then you would get your precipitation induced fog down here. Okay. Yeah. Kind of how that would look. Um, so, you know, something to think about if you're, um, you know, flying and you're going to fly through or land near a warm front. Um, if you check your temperatures, you know, maybe check some airports behind the warm front and then in front of the warm front, and if there's a, a drastic change in temperature, or, you know, 20 degree difference, then, um, and there's some rain on the radar, you know, you're going to probably get some fogging conditions. Um, if you're landing, you know, before the, the, the warm front uh, passes, per, perhaps. So to calculate, um, you actually have to, there will probably be a question to calculate a cloud base. There will probably be one question about it. Um, I've seen it a couple times um, for the cloud base. Um, they'll give you, they might give you a METAR, and you have to look at the temperature dew point um, information from that METAR, and they'll say, you know, what, what can you, and they won't give you the cloud bases in the METAR, um, and they'll say, you know, what's the cloud base? And so... Um, you would basically find the spread, um, so you would, you know, subtract the temperature from the dew point and then divide by, excuse me, 4.4 .4 and then multiply that by 1,000. And really that's just, it's one of those formulas you're just going to have to write down and probably remember. Um, but if you have, and this, I actually bought this uh, when I was studying my private pilot. Um, let me show it to you here. This is the ASA, it's a certified, you can take this into the test. This is an electronic flight computer. Mm -hmm. 
um, and you can there it is, cloud base. You can actually calculate it right there. Oh, there you go. Okay. And it just it just does it for you. So that's another option. Among a bazillion other things it does that makes it so much easier than the mechanical one. But um, yeah, so here's your types of clouds. Um, your stratus is like a layer, you know, and those are typical of a uh, a standard day. Cumulus, or I'm sorry, not a standard day, a stable atmosphere. Um, that's resisting lifting. Um, you know, your cumulus is heap type clouds, those bubble, uh, like popcorn looking clouds that just bubble, and then those develop into thunderstorms eventually. Um, cirrus, wispy, nimbus. Nimbus indicates rain, so if there's strato nimbus clouds, there's stratus clouds that are raining, or cumulonimbus, you know, uh, a rain cloud, which is typically a thunderstorm cloud. Uh, we already talked about lenticular. Yeah, so here's an example of calculating that that cloud base. Okay. And it's pretty cool because Fahrenheit. No, it doesn't matter. Yeah, this is in Fahrenheit. But I mean, if it's in they give you the temperature in Celsius, though, in, in METAR, right? Is the formula the same? You're going to have to, um, you're going to have to convert. Hold on one second, sorry. It may work the same, but I'm guessing not. No. It, it, no, it, it wouldn't. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't. Um, yeah, you would have to convert and let's see if I can show you here. That's not it. So if you take your mechanical um, E6B Well, it's not going to let me do it. It has a conversion on it. Yeah, there's, that's what I was going to say. There's a conversion behind here. I don't think I can, I can't slide this and move this. Um, I have too many windows. There we go. Um, yeah, you can, that's what I would do is I would convert, you'd convert it to Fahrenheit and do 4.4. Um, And it's just, yeah, it's in Fahrenheit. So you'd convert. So you'd make note of that to convert it to Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, here's your basic cloud types. You have high clouds, middle clouds, low clouds, and then your massive <laughs> thunderstorm cloud that can go up to sixty thousand feet or more. Um, have you ever seen Virga? Uh, no. It's uh, it's pretty interesting to see in flight. Um, looks like like mist or wispy cloud. Uh, here's a picture of it. Just looks like some cloud, you know, drooping down, but it's actually rain and it's evaporating before it hits the ground. So you could actually, I mean, if you were to fly under this, um, you would get rain on your windshield, but... But not on the ground, okay. Yeah, not on the ground. They're not getting rain, which is interesting. Hmm. 
Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about this with the stable air. You generally have your stratiform clouds, um, resist lifting, um, some characteristics, and they may ask you a question of this of stable air. Um, stable air is um, usually better to fly in. It's, it's usually does not have much turbulence uh, at all, um, but the visibility is usually restricted. Um, can have widespread areas of clouds, and the rain, if it is raining in stable air, it's usually uh, steady. Just one of those days where it's just raining for hours, you know, nice and steady, uh, or drizzling. Um, uh, moist, unstable air uh, characteristics will form the cumuliform, the thunderstorm, showery type uh, precipitation. It'll have turbulent air, it'll be a bouncy day. Um, um, and the visibility is typically good in uh, unstable air. And the reason that is is that the uh, lifting action of the air is lifting out all of the um, um, uh, what you want to call it? I'm sorry. Uh, like pollution and dust and all that stuff that's in the air that res that resists the um, or the moisture, you know, the haziness, all that lifting action brings that uh, upward in the atmosphere, and it um, you get those are the days that you can, you know, it feels like you can look, you know, see when you're flying like 50 miles ahead of you. Um, right. It's usually an unstable atmosphere. Uh, so the different fronts, cold front, warm front, stationary, occluded. Um, We already talked about this. Okay. We already talked about this with thunderstorms for the test. Unstable lifting force, moisture. These are some of the different types of thunderstorms. Okay, so here's uh, different turbulence. Um, we talked about it yesterday about slowing the maneuvering speed for turbulence uh, penetration so you don't overstress the airplane. Mm -hmm. um, and the key thing is when you, when you fly into turbulence, you don't want to try and maneuver the airplane because if you try to bank, um, you're going to add load factor. So you're just going to have all that turbulent air adding load factor to your airplane. Then you're going to bank and put more load factor on the airplane, and then you can you know, stall it or overstress it if you're above maneuvering speed. So the recommended procedure is to um, um, keep a level attitude um, and slow to maneuvering speed. And it's, it's a really good idea in your airplane to memorize, kind of just know in your head what power setting gives you maneuvering speed. Because another thing that happens, I don't think it's mentioned here, but when you uh, experience turbulence or some wind shearing, you can get some pretty big fluctuations if you haven't experienced it already in your airspeed indicator. Right. right. So if you're trying to slow to maneuvering speed, um, all of a sudden you're messing with power settings and you're not, you know, you forget to, you know, it's easy to not fly the airplane and then you find yourself in a bank or a descent or something, you know. So the recommended procedure is keep a level straight attitude, focus on that, reduce to a power setting that you know gives you maneuvering speed, and then accept those fluctuations in the airspeed indicator as they come. Um, and that would be the, the procedure for um, turbulence penetration. Um, so yeah, your low-level turbulence, um, know that that's due to surface heating or friction. Um, you can have mechanical, uh, if you've, you know, flown into an airport uh, or if your airport has, you know, trees at the end of the runway or buildings or hangars, 
Uh, sometimes, depending on the wind direction, you get some of that tumbling effect or it comes up over the trees. And I know that um, our airport, we have um, a couple runways that have trees. There's like a cutout of trees so the runway, you know, uh, fits. And once you come over those trees and drop down the runway, you get like a little sinking effect because of that wind flowing over the trees. Um, so it's always good to be aware of that. Uh, that's mechanical turbulence. Convective would be updrafts and downdrafts, um, obviously from you know unequal heating of the Earth's surface. Um, and it <laughs> here in Florida, I experienced it for the. I mean, I've had it happen in Pennsylvania, but Florida, it just wow. In the summer, it it, it was this was my first summer here, uh, flying, and definitely, I mean, I I had I had a moment where I mean I couldn't believe it. I was flying straight and level. And I feel a little bump in the seat, and I look down, and I'm climbing at 500 feet a minute at a straight and level at a straight and level attitude. I mean, that's just, and I felt a little feeling in the seat of my pants, you know, kind of like a little push, and I couldn't. And all of a sudden, next thing I know, I mean, my altitude, I just went up 200 feet. I mean, quick we, uh, we had before that I could think. In, in a 150 landing a few years ago, and. Uh, Coming in on final and pulling power and not losing altitude at all, and uh, we're 200 feet over the over the numbers with no power in and still couldn't really lose any altitude. And uh, then we came out the other side of the uh, updraft. It was like falling, <laughs> like someone wow. cords on a on an elevator, and uh, we got the nose down and landed. But it was it was weird because you couldn't. Couldn't lose altitude. Right. Yeah, it, it is. It's it's a weird feeling when you get that updraft because it, yeah. it's like the airplane's not behaving correctly. You're just like and you don't you don't. The thing that surprised me was I thought, oh, if I hit an updraft that strong, like I would just feel it. It would it would feel like somebody just, you know, I don't know, like beam me up, Scotty, or something. Right. And it, it's right. it's not. It's very subtle, and you're like kind of nosing over, and you're like, why am I not descending? <laughs> Yeah. And uh, exactly. yeah, yep. So um, that would be convective turbulence. Um, frontal turbulence um, occurs typically in front of a, a a little bit of a narrow zone in front of a fast-moving cold front, um, and also you know in front of a, a fast-moving cold front, there's really really bad weather, low ceilings. Um, so probably shouldn't be flying there anyways. Um, and then wake turbulence, we mentioned that a little bit, and I knew I knew we had some good diagrams coming up. Um, and so uh, wake turbulence, the thing to know for the test and, and in general is um, it's created when an airplane's generating lift. Um, so when the wheels are on the ground, the airplane's not generating lift. So until it rotates and the wheels start to come up off the ground, that's when it, the wing starts generating lift and that uh, wake turbulence or wingtip vortices start generating. Um, and it's the greatest when the airplane is heavy, slow, and in a clean configuration. So that would be during takeoff. That's when they are the, the wingtip for, uh, turbulence is the worst. Um, they tend to sink below the flight path that's generating them. Um, and this is for the test. I know there's a question. I mean, I don't know if it'll come up, but I know it's in the question bank for sure. Most of this stuff is. but. Um, the most hazardous situation for wake turbulence is a light quartering tailwind. Um, and the reason that is, is imagine this, uh, you know, 747 just took off out of an airport and you're going to take off behind them. And these wingtip vortices typically descend and they, they go outward. So um, a light quartering tailwind, so if there's like a slight wind shift, and you're about to take off, and you notice there's a slight, like you see the wind sock and a slight quartering tailwind, um, I would not take off uh, because this wingtip vortice can get pushed out and held onto the runway because it wants to go outward and it, it'll just kind of hang there. It won't really leave. Oh, I see. Yeah. So that's why that's the most dangerous situation is a light quartering tailwind. But typically, you know, you're taking off into a headwind. Um, but that's to be aware of that. Um, the 
Yeah, so in a situation with a higher angle of attack, the heavier, the slower, the wing has to generate more lift. You know, we kind of saw that um, chart earlier that uh, as airspeed increased, you know, we saw that lift drag chart and induced drag. Uh, as airspeed increased, induced drag rapidly decreased, and that's because the wing has to produce less lift to hold up the airplane as you go faster. Um, so as it gets slower, that angle of attack increases, the wing needs to generate more and more lift to hold the airplane up, and that's when you get your, your um, intense wingtip uh, vortices. And they can hang out there for about three minutes or so until they dissipate. Yeah, right. There's a little picture. There you go. Yep. <clears throat> so I was just looking uh, for a second. Uh, I couldn't find it. Didn't pop up. I was just curious if it would. Um, there's a little. There's a nice demo video of wake, wake, or, uh, wingtip vortices, uh, but it didn't pop up. Okay, that's all stuff we've already talked about. Um, are you familiar with how to take off and land with? with uh, the wingtip vortices, the wake turbulence? Uh, if I want to recall, you get up over it as, as soon as possible, right? So, yeah. So. Yeah, so I mean, if here's your runway and your large jet takes off here, um, you, you want to obviously, yeah, you want to take off and stay above him. The problem is, is that those jets can climb out better than we can. Yeah. Um, so th really the, the realistic, the best way to do it is to get up and start turning and get just get a, out of his flight path altogether. Right. But know that this wingtip vortice is going to move slowly over here. You know, so you want to, you, you don't want to do like a five degree turn. You want to do a bigger turn than that. Um, so you might not be able to fly like a standard pattern that you normally would. You might have to Tell the tower, hey, you know, wake, wake, uh, turbulence avoidance. I need to turn 30 degrees to the right, or I need to make my right turn now, you know. Um, and that actually, uh, we, I flew across country down to Fort Lauderdale, and they were, I mean, it was, it was pretty wild, you know, Fort Lauderdale International. There's me and my little uh, Piper Arrow, and, uh, you know, landed, um, 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 came back in taxi to take back off and, and come back to Stewart and uh, when I took off you know before that there was a 737 that took off and and I took off you know I made sure I was up way before him and then the tower you know helped me out because I was going to request a left turn but they helped me out and I mean I was only like two three hundred feet above the runway and they're like you know they gave me a 90 degree left turn to just totally get out of the way That's good. Um, yeah. so I mean it was nice when you know they're aware of it too um, and then, you know, for landing, you want to stay, a, same thing, above and land beyond where, where they touch down, where the wheels touch down. And so you want to land beyond it. This is some high uh, drawings. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, they're not that great. That I'm, not a, I'm not a good artist. <laughs> um... Yeah, and, and uh, I mean, what you're going to experience if you fly through one is a rolling moment. And I, that happened to me. Uh, uh, I was flying a practice in an ILS approach um, and a small twin. I mean, it wasn't even, I could only I could only imagine what like a 737 would do. Um, it was a small twin, I think, like a Beach Baron or something. And um, it wasn't even like a King Air or something that big. And uh, it was on a visual approach ahead of us. I was under my hood, my instructor was next to me, 
and we're flying this ILS approach, and I, I can't see, you know, and I asked him, like, hey, we good? You know, he's like, oh, yeah, we got good separation. And he was slightly above, and we were slightly below, and he was coming in, and all of a sudden, the airplane um, banked to the right about 20 degrees, and I caught it and stopped it at 20 degrees, and I had a full aileron deflection to the left. Wow. Okay. To, stop, to stop it. I mean, that's how quick it just lifted that wing and just wanted to spin the airplane. It's like, it's like a little mini tornado in the sky. Um, oh, so that was a, you said it was a, uh, a King Air, or what was the jet? No, it, it, it was smaller than a King Air. I think it was like a Beach Baron or something. I mean, it wasn't even that big, that big of an airplane, and I, I couldn't believe that that was generating that much uh, vortex. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can and see how, and obviously we caught this right or this left wing vortex because it right. wanted to bank the airplane to the right. Um, yeah, it was very surprising. Um, so it, experiencing that real world just made me think um, how much caution I exercise if I'm ever going to an airport with large aircraft like a 737 or something like that. Right. Um, so yeah, um, it's very important stuff. Here's just more wake turbulence, another picture of it, areas to avoid. So yeah, if you're converging in the air and you see a jet traffic ahead of you, you want to get slightly above him um, to avoid him. You don't want to fly behind, you know, you don't want to have him pass and then you fly behind him even if these circle. Here's a little bit of a picture of an inversion. You know, normal lapse rate, the hot air slowly rises up into the cold air and as it cools. And then you get this warm air inversion layer. What what creates that inversion again? There you go. Um usually it's on a cool night. Um or I'm sorry, not a cool night, but a um a night where there's calm winds, there's no wind, and it's clear, like a clear night. So, um, like if you had a layer of clouds or some, you know, um, clouds or, or just high humidity or something like that, or not a clear night, those clouds can hold the, the warm air down. Um, but on a cool night, you could have this warm air rise in this stable layer of air. So if it's stable, it's going to resist lifting action, right? So you're going to have the, on the cool, uh, clear night, no wind, the air is going to rise up and just kind of sit there. It's going to stop at a certain point. And then cool air is going to kind of come underneath and replace it and you get it and see you're getting this wind shear type right. activity. Yeah, and here you go. Clear, cool nights, light winds. <laughs> 